I think I'm about thought long enough. But I don't know if anybody has questions, then Chris will answer because I'm so deaf. <laughs> <laughs> but I can when say when things say, and especially if there are young people here. Everything in life you have to make choices, even about your meals. And sometimes those choices are difficult. And here there was a choice, do I help? Because the majority of the Netherlands didn't do, and from other countries too, didn't do help. But if you think, what would Jesus do? And what, would he let those Jews all be killed? And would he, so you felt that it's, and that's for children who are here, the young people, you have your whole life ahead. You don't know if it will be if easy or difficult. But I can tell you one thing, I'm old, but in every life you get then sometimes more heavy burdens. And you can only do what I scraped with my bobby pin when they had not taken it out in the wall of my cell. And that is what Jesus said, Lo, I am with you always. You are never alone. I was never alone. So he is always there. And for also for the young people here, you don't know what your life will bring. But remember, he is always there. And he helps. And he gives, it says also in the Bible, he will give you not anything more than you can bear. And then he will give you the strength. So this is how I want to end. He is always there. And he's now with you. Whatever your problems are, everybody has problems. So, any questions? I'll have this microphone. Hello. Um, I do. I, I not a question, but um, I was reading in your book today about like Corey Ten Boom. We've talked about this in another family, and that they would never tell lies. And oh, yeah. we don't want to, you know, um, I mean, my daughter's here, and I don't want to say, it's okay to lie. So how did you come to grips with the fact that it was okay to lie? Yes, yeah, there was one family, and they were willing to take the Jew, and they took him. Yeah, okay, thank you. <laughs> and they took a Jew, and that guy did something very stupid, because all the houses were so close, and then they, he came to the front and looked out of the window, and the neighbor saw him, and that neighbor was a Nazi. So anyway, that guy had to get out of prison. And what happened again? Well, how, do you, how did you justify lying? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I always thought of in the Bible, what was it again? Rahab. Rahab. And she told a big fat lie. <laughs> she is in the ancestry of Jesus. <laughs> so I thought, even if you tell a lie, sometimes you're blessed. <laughs> <laughs> if I tell the truth, I couldn't tell the truth. No, it's really mir miraculous and everything. If I think of the rainbow, and I think of the old box, and I think of the letter that I still got from him, and he never came back. And that is when all my, from the 13 people we were, eight were killed. And then I didn't want to stay in the Netherlands. I had two horrible, I, couldn't, I was drawn on days off to the places where we were together. And I thought, I have to get out of here. So then I studied nursing three years and a year maternity. And I was fluent in Spanish. And Hein worked for the big shell company. And they loved him. He has a marmor, he's on a marmor plate with the people who gave their life. And they loved me too. And they said, I was called by the top. And they said, do you still always want to leave the country? I said, oh yes. The moment I can't stay here. I have too many horrible memories. And then they said, would you like to go for us? Now that he's like, and may ask, will you please work for us? So I said, of course. And then, then they found out I was a nurse. They sent me as a nurse to Venezuela. And I was there for over 10 years. And then I met a man that I later married. And I had still, 
and I married at 39. I couldn't forget him for years. And then when I was married, I got a, a boy, a son at 41 and a daughter at 43. So everybody, but I do it late, so I have my kids late. So they are now 50 and something, and it's wonderful. So I'm very blessed. Anything else? Does anybody have another question? I'm curious what you think about the current state of Germany and some of the institutions that may seem similar, such as the compulsory school attendance uh, for youth. Um, what you know, what you might think about that. He is wondering um, what your thoughts are on the current state of Germany and some of the compulsory schools in, Ger in, in Germany. Yes. At that time, it was right bad. Now, he, he wants to know now what your thoughts are of some of the schools in Germany. Well, I was invited when the book was written, it was translated in German. And I remember that we have here in Gantra with Rabbi Lewis. And Rabbi Lewis, of course, the Jewish people love me. And he had asked me to come for dinner with his wife, Shirley. And at that time, uh, there was so much unrest and everything. And then uh, he asked me, I had just had an invitation to come to Germany for a big TV station and to speak all over in Nuremberg and in Berlin. And I thought, no. I had such a trouble, and I can tell you honest, it took me years to forgive the Germans because they were so evil. And the, the, just think, little babies were killed in the gas chamber. And I thought, I, I couldn't get it out of, and I really had no right to play to our father, to pray to our father. Forgive us our debtors, we forgive our debtors. And then at one point, I uh, realized, and I was just then also invited by Rabbi Lewis, and I got that invitation from Germany. And I had just gotten my hate, but I thought under control. So I thought, I'm not going, because then that might come back if I hear German all around me. And so I sat at the table with Rabbi Lewis and his wife, and he says, uh, I said, yeah, they asked me to come and speak to them, but I'm not going. And I still see it. He puts his fork down, and he said, Deep, you have to go. And then I went to the church, and they also, I didn't want to speak about it anymore, and they were singing, I will tell the great things you have done, and I wasn't doing that. I was just avoiding everything I wanted to forget. But then I went to Germany. And it was a good experience. And everywhere they were so sorry for what had happened. And so I, I didn't give my name, but I had to speak for the TV station. And then afterward, the TV station that knew that I lived in the Netherlands. And uh, I got piles of letters that people had sent to a TV station. And they asked for forgiveness. And you know what many people don't know, and I know that happened in 1980, so that is far after the war, the government of Germany officially asked forgiveness of the government of Israel. And most people don't know that. So I think they see it. And at the moment, I don't know, I think everywhere here there is such an unrest. And I don't know if you find that, but I have my ears open and my eyes open, and they have here the Civil Liberties Union, and they want to get God out of everything. And even from the coin in God we trust, they would like that. And I'm a little bit wondering about our government now. They don't take a big stand against all this. So I think we live in a dangerous time and we have to take a stand. And the evil people scream and tell what they think. But we, the good ones, have, who believe in God, we have also to speak out. 
and I don't know, I pray for wisdom for our government, but I don't feel very happy at the moment. I think there's a big action to get away from God. Anyone? When I first heard about this event, I thought, oh boy, I better carry a box of tissue with me because I'm going to cry. But it turned out that I was crying because I laughed so hard. <laughs> so I, I'm wondering, um, your sense of humor, did it, did it have any place in, in during your personal tragedy or is this a latter development after you went through the tragedy and now you can look back on it? Thinks you're funny. <laughs> <laughs> you know I think that after faith, that the greatest gift from God is a sense of humor. <laughs> Honest, faith is the most important. But think how life boring. And then they say to me, Be, "Are you being good?" I said, "No, that's so boring." <laughs> Does that answer your question? I think it's always been a part of her. Okay, thank you. He just wondered if that was that came after the war or if you always had it. I think I can say No, that. I always had it. <laughs> <laughs> and my father also has a terrific sense of humor. Oh. Yeah, that's right. No, that's a real wonderful thing because even sometimes in horrible situations you can see something so funny. <laughs> yeah. Are there any more questions? It must be very difficult to have learned about the, the death of Hank. How long did it take you to find out about that? How long did it take for you to learn about Hank's death? Well, the war was over. And he had been arrested, so I knew. And he had smuggled a little note out in the train, and he said he wrote in that, and it was found. And that is, do we have it there? The small thing, no, he showed it. And if you think how much rain and how much dew at night, and it was written on toilet paper, so that's another big miracle of God. And there came a man at our house, and he brought it. And his son was also in the resistance. And I remember it was June 5, and the doorbell rang, and there was this man, and the war was over in May, so it was just, and this man lived in another part of the Netherlands. And he came, and I said, with a happy face, I opened the door, I said, come in. I said, isn't it wonderful? I said, the war is over, and now our guys are coming back. And he was very down. And he said, yeah, but you don't know if they all come back. I said, oh, but the war is over and God is protecting. And I was so upbeat that he came to tell me that he had been killed in Belgium. He had been brought to the most horrible, uh, horrible place in Germany. It was in the north and it was called Neuengamme. And there was also a camp. And in Putten in the Netherlands, there was a big, that was near a big, big highway. It was a little village. And then a top guy from Germany was in his beautiful car, and they had planted a bomb. And that car exploded. And then the right away the Gestapo came, and all the Germans, and they surrounded this whole village. And they drove all the men in a church, and they started burn all the houses that village is called Putten. And uh, all the women there were widows because they drove them to, brought them to Neuengamme. And from Neuengamme, only eight people survived, I heard later. So many were killed there, no food, and no, so it was horrible. And then this man came down to tell me that he had been in Neuengamme, but was still, he was, he had false papers that he, priests and pastors didn't have to go to the service. So he had, a, and all my friends got papers that we, we, we stole the papers, and then we had a guy who filled it out, 
and I worked only with pastors. <laughs> Everybody got false guard and pastor. So I was also, but those pastors were all brought to Dachau and he was in Neuengamme and it was horrible because he wrote a note that I found and that came to my house, that little thing. I never know who sent it, but it was somebody who survived him. And he said um, the time had been taken away on a Sunday night, that he always had tried to lift up others and talk about Jesus, and so he did a lot of good. And then uh, he was taken away, and he was, he said they were, he was, had, there was no food, and they were all, they died of the hunger there, and he was very hungry. And uh, then they took him away on the Sunday night, and then they never came back, so he was probably, I don't know. And I had no pain. None of us escaped because all the guys were killed in, in the ovens. And maybe it's crazy, but I want to be cremated like all my friends. I have not the grave of anybody. That was a horrible thing. But if you think. Alright, we can probably do one more just for the sake of time. Edmund Burke, the Irish politician, says that all it takes for evil to triumph is man of goodwill to do nothing. In today's world, we see a lot of evil. In today's world, we see Venezuela, the country that you were a nurse, falling apart and people being shot in the streets and a totalitarian government running the place. I come from Cuba, and I experienced what those Nazi youth children experienced when I was in school there. We were indoctrinated. We had papers. We couldn't move freely. And yet, we see all of this happening. What do you say to the young people here at Tucker College? What do you say to the young people in the United States who more and more and more are becoming isolationists and say, it's not my problem. And again, all it takes for evil to triumph is for men of goodwill to do nothing. He said that there is a, a quote, and I know that Heinz said something similar, all it takes for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. And he said that he came, I mean, he's in Venezuela now being taken over by a totalitarian government totalitarian government. He himself is from Cuba, and they were indoctrinated. And he said, what do you say to young people today who are living in this isolationist society that say, it's not, it doesn't affect me? What do you say to them? Is that? That is correct. What do you say to in, in countries where it is forbidden to talk about? What do you say to kids today who are in, and she and I talk about this a lot, people today who think, it's not my problem, don't worry about it. Whatever is happening in our world today, and people are not taking an interest because they don't think that it even affects them. Even in our own country, some of the things that are happening. What do you, as someone who has experienced this horrific evil, what do you say to young people today who think yeah. that it, it's, it's not my issue, don't worry about it? That is the horrible atmosphere now. Don't be involved, stay out of it. And that's totally wrong. And that is why each one of us here, you are all Christians, I think. And we have to speak out. And we have to tell the young people also that whole life is making choices. And if you know the Bible, and if you read about Jesus, you have the guidelines, and that's the only thing that we follow what Jesus said. And I think the disciples also, Paul had already trouble in, when he went around. And I think that also the Christians in the end times, we will get it very difficult. But we have to make the right choices. And it's totally wrong, and that is true what you say at the moment. 
I, where I live also now, I'm at home for elderly people. They are not interested in anything politics, and they have to thank family with a lot of children. They are busy in the mother's with cooking and the father with the job, but the people, when you're older, you have to thank, and we have to speak out and not be silent. But that's the thing that each one with his own conscience has to do. Because I think at one time, lots of people had that land, what would Jesus do? And maybe that was a good thing, because it makes you think, what would he do? And then we have the perfect example. But it's difficult, and especially, like also that in the prison, you know, you had your choice to follow Jesus or have it easy. You can't do anything except speak out. Thank you. That is all the time we have for questions right now. So I got what I wanted, I can only thank you. <laughs> in my life. No, and I think that the majority for you, if you had been in that time and there were Jewish people around you, you would have done the same. And you don't have the consequences, but that's then up to God. And whatever comes, he will give you the strength. No, it's not special. And I'm sure that you, if you saw little Jewish kids, you would have done the same. Well, I think everyone here would like to say thank you for coming and sharing your story. I know it's, it's a big inspiration to all of us and a good reminder of um, how we are supposed to live as Christians. And I just wanted to remind you all that Deet will be signing um, copies of her books in the back and they're for sale for $12 if you would like to stop by. And I just want to thank you all very much for coming out and listening to Deet's story. And thank you again. I think we could give her one more round of applause.